Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. The word poison comes from the Latin potare, which means to drink, and it evokes this feeling that sometimes the poisons in our lives are things that we ourselves decide to ingest in the hope that we will overcome something, in the hope that we are stronger than, in the hope that we can work through something as a point of decision. These are often the poisons that are insights that are so difficult for us to manage that we think of them as dangerous. Poison as a symbol shows up in fairy tales, in myths, in our literature, in our films. There's something deep and archetypal, and by the way, very, very ancient, about the idea of poison, both being accidentally poisoned, perhaps by being bitten by a poisonous serpent, but also the application of poison, whether it's to harm an enemy or for an animal to subdue prey and then be able to survive. But from the beginning, there is an instinct and an understanding that poisons exist in the world. Infants are born with natural instincts to avoid foul-smelling or foul-tasting items. One of the ancient goddesses of poison, the Phytis, is actually the goddess of foul-smelling things that come out of the earth, which we are designed at birth to avoid. So all this goes to say that the archetype and symbol of poison seems to be creeping around and showing up in so many different areas that we thought that we would dedicate an episode to hashing that out. Well, it's a really powerful image, isn't it, of poison. And I think it does have all of these psychological resonance and echoes. And I, I'm thinking about the fact that poison, Joseph, I think you made such an important point when you said that poison, it, there's this sense that that we either knowingly or perhaps unconsciously partake in the act of being poisoned, because it, it does include this idea that we are drinking it. There's a, a distinction between poison and venom, that poison is something that you bite and venom is something that bites you. Mm. But, but I think that the notion of, of, of something that is sort of toxic is, is similar to both of those sense. But the idea of poison, something that we ingest either, either again, knowingly or unconsciously, whether we're talking about sort of actual poison in food, for example, or whether we're, we're thinking about it more psychologically. You know, interestingly, the Greek word for poison is pharmakon, which means poison as well as cure. I'm thinking that what is so sort of insidious about poison is that it works on us from within. Whether we have ingested it or whether we have been infected by it, uh, from outside, there's something really horrifying about this invisible thing working on us in invisible ways, uh, somehow corroding our very being. Yeah, that, that feels really important, that it's doing the damage in this clandestine way, working on us from the inside. It blurs the boundaries about what's out there and what's in here it really sort of attacks our sense of self in, in some ways. There's a sense of being attacked from within. So one of the ways that that lights up for me is how certain kind of neurotic elements can prey upon us, that we can be poisoned by self-hatred or we can be poisoned by a betrayal. 
I think of some people having paralyzing inhibitions where they are frozen in a kind of poisonous mental state and they can't accomplish an important task or any of the various destructive tendencies that cause various kinds of dysfunction and maybe even fatal dysfunctions at the level of the psyche. And these poisons that turn into attitudes may be something we've inherited from family beliefs, family systems, or various kinds of experiences that we've had, which we then internalize and they take on a life of their own, much as Deb was saying, the kind of secret poison that's in the psychic bloodstream and is eroding things and making us sick. But we can't see it from the outside. We don't quite know what's wrong, but we certainly feel a degradation of our functioning. I'm thinking about how we poison ourselves with toxic beliefs, uh, whether it's some kind of a neurosis or an irrational belief or the idea that we really should or shouldn't do something or other people should or shouldn't do something, believing that we can't stand something that if we succumb to these kinds of toxicities uh, and mistake these beliefs for uh, something that is real in the external world, it works as a kind of poison against a full, vibrant, and balanced life. And I think these psychic poisons are demonstrated in, in all kinds of fairy tales and myths whether it's the poison apple that's given to Snow White, which is in some ways reminiscent of the apple that Eve decides to taste in the Garden of Eden, which has such a radical effect on consciousness that they can no longer stay in this naive, heavenly bliss. You know, I'm I'm appreciating what you're both saying about the way that poison as an image kind of outpictures the way that something can kind of go in psychically and erode. And I'm also aware that actual poison, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not a toxicologist, but I think it's almost always dose dependent. So for example, there's a, a substance that many of us may have already consumed today that uh, in, in sort of mild doses is, uh, makes us feel really good, and that is caffeine. But if you take too much caffeine, it is very deadly and it will kill you very quickly. So you, you can buy, I think, caffeine in a powder form, for example, from health food stores, and you have to be really careful because if you take it straight up, it, it is, um, it's quite deadly. You know, I think that's that's true of, of many things. So, so then we're sort of in this territory of almost a sort of psychic immune system or an immunity to to toxins and 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 somewhere in this uh, neighborhood of a little bit applied in the right way might be helpful whereas too much that overwhelms us could be deadly and i'm i'm thinking about this uh, psychologically you know, there's. I, I have a. I have a colleague, uh, a, a, a man who's a, a, a therapist who got attacked by uh, by a client. You know, just verbally, verbally attacked. Uh, you know, she really lit into him and and let him know that she thought he was, you know, worthless and no good and all all this kind of stuff. And for a variety of reasons, I mean, he and I have talked about this case, and her sting really went in. The venom really took hold, and he developed a kind of crippling back spasm later that day that took about a week to resolve. But in fact, um, had he oriented to her attack differently, it wouldn't have had the same effect. There was something about his psyche that was vulnerable at that time that just let the poison in. And therefore, it was it was poisonous. Whereas, if he had been oriented to the attack a little differently, he could have used it psychologically with her to explore what was causing her to want to attack him like that. 
and it might have been really therapeutically useful for her, although it probably wouldn't have been pleasant for either one of them. There's, there's something about kind of what we do with it psychologically, and can we inure ourselves to it a little bit? And is a small dose of poison possibly therapeutic? I mean, this is the idea behind homeopathy. If we think about it sort of symbolically, it seems like many things are like that in the psyche. I'm thinking of um, bee venom therapy, which, you know, I don't know if it's been scientifically validated, but my, my understanding is that people have used bee venom therapy for, uh, is it arthritis? For mm-hmm. a long time. So again, it's sort of the right amount of poison is the cure. And also the right amount has very much to do with where we are psychologically. Reminds me of the general category of exposure therapy. Yes, there's literally bee venom. But if somebody, for instance, has a terrible phobia of bees, you might expose them to a photograph of a bee and then help them regain red regulation and then a bee in a jar and then maybe standing near a bee on a flower and each time the person feels unwell with just the exposure to the image of the thing that has a toxic venomous fear inside of them and just as Lisa was saying there's a kind of tolerance a capacity to metabolize the thing that is making me sick And for some people, at the end of it, they really do feel kind of equanimous or balanced in the face of the thing that was making them sick previously, which flies in the face of a more current trend, which is to never expose our kids to things that make them feel uncomfortable or unwell. And just as it is psychically and physically, They Mm -hmm. don't develop a kind of appropriate psychological immune response. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I suppose related to that is uh, the rise of um, kids who are allergic to things, which it looks like now it's partly because we didn't feed them peanuts that they then developed peanut allergies. So so there is this uh, kind of uh, justification for not avoiding psychological toxins, because doing so can kind of potentiate uh, an extra vulnerability to them. Yeah, that our psychological immune system is really very parallel to our physical immune system. And some of the current thinking now for children is let them play in the dirt and get a dog, (laughs) a dog that can run around outside and that the child can pet Uh, so that the child's immune response is robust and sturdy. And we're we're making the analogy to psychological development, that then when somebody calls that little boy a a name out out in the uh, sandbox, you know, he can come right back with, that's not true. So we're back to what you had said earlier about how uh, it's all about the dose, and titrating, shaping, grading the the dose. It's about the dose and it's about our resilience against it too. Because I, I'm thinking of my my friend that I discussed this this case with, and it wasn't just the dose. It was the fact that he was willing to let her words take root in his psyche. They went in, they stuck. They rooted. And so he didn't, he didn't, he didn't sort of have an appropriate clinical shield up, you know, that would allow him to um, receive her words without them sort of penetrating. And, you know, it's like she flung a dart at him and it just went right in, you know, related to this idea of poison. I'm thinking about the way that we use the word toxic in popular parlance these days. So we'll talk about toxic people or a toxic parent. I I think I'm curious about our use of that term because once we write someone off as toxic, 
you know, that's kind of it. It sort of gives us permission to never have anything to do with that person ever again. Yeah. And I, I certainly think there are people who work in our lives like that. And I think it's good to be able to recognize that and make a decision not to have further contact with them. And it's something, of course, I've done. And I've, I've helped Analizans parse that. This might be a person that you just don't want to bother having contact with. And yet I also have a kind of space around it. Because it, it seems to me that it's it's a very uh, quick way to write someone off entirely. And just as we've been saying with poison, the right dose in the right way might be helpful. It might be curative even. And I wonder with some of the so-called toxic people in our lives, are we insulating ourselves in some cases unnecessarily from someone who who might be unpleasant or challenging, but perhaps could be helpful for us to be in contact with in one way or another. And there's just a discernment to do around that, I think. And using the word toxic in that way tends to make it a very black and white issue. And some of our teachers advance us because of the stress they put us under, that they are kind of painful teachers who, in hindsight, we might be able to thank for strengthening us or telling us something that was wounding to our self-esteem or challenging us in a way that we were sure that we couldn't surmount. That takes me uh, back to the idea of the dose. And what is the appropriate dose Uh, that a person's system can kind of rally against and become stronger. As an analogy to a developmental process where ego strength is built through frustration. Uh, And and you want to uh, really be aware of the degree of frustration that you can tell a toddler to wait a minute. And the toddler may be frustrated but it's a good tool for learning that he can wait until mommy gets off the phone or is finished with some task. Uh, You don't want to make the toddler too overwhelmingly frustrated uh, and just defeated, but a little can go a long way. So it's, it's what you were saying, Lisa, about discernment. Can I use this uh, for personal growth? Uh, Is it a challenge? How can I understand it? When we call someone toxic, there's probably some process of projection going on there. Right. We could say that poison is the dissociated underbelly of all the things that we tend to idealize. So the person that we're sure is just a big bucket of poison is also carrying some of the difficult material about ourselves, about the culture or about perhaps even that personality character structure that we're sure that we just couldn't tolerate knowing anything about. So the the projection is often some part of our very own shadow that comes back to us and penetrates. Like your colleague, Lisa, you know that what this particular client said resonated because it was part of his or her shadow. Right. Right. And, and so we are confronted with ourselves. That's right. That's right. And, and an example of this from a fairy tale would be perhaps the most famous poison scene in a fairy tale. And that is Snow White and her mother's poison apple. So if you'll recall, Snow White is famously very sweet and innocent And the dwarves have taken her in and she's cooking for them and she's cleaning for them. And they say, you know, don't let anyone in. Don't forget your mother wants to kill you. Now, in the original Grimm's, it's her mother. They later changed it to stepmother, but I'm going to use mother (laughs) because that was in the original. She first comes with a poison, poison laces, I think. And then she comes with a poison comb. And in the last visit, she brings a poison apple. 
the apple is is beautiful and red and juicy and Snow White is so easily seduced. She's seduced by all of these items, but the apple is particularly seductive. And of course, it you know we immediately think of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and eating from the the tree of knowledge and and the the redness of the apple is being you know perhaps there's something here about sexuality and the the sort of seductiveness of this sweet red apple that Snow White in her innocence has split off and wants to not know about, but she's also very drawn to it. It's as if she knows she needs that poison and that that is the thing that will ultimately transform her. And I believe that that's exactly what happens because it seems that she, you know, wakes up from her slumber after she eats the poison apple and is quite a different person if you read the fairy tale than she was before she went into that slumber. Now she has access to sexuality and aggression. So she needed to metabolize that poison. So there's a way, I think, and this goes right back to what you led with at the top, Joseph, that we participate in our own poisoning. And often that is the thing that transforms us and helps us to grow. What I think about just modern culture and the way that we participate in our own poisoning in as much as we take great draughts of various things that then come back to us and challenge us and haunt us. You know, I think about all of this public media curiosity about the impact of YouTube algorithms and this idea that we stay on YouTube and it figures out what we're attracted to and then it keeps feeding us and feeding us and feeding us this diet. And then our attitudes, our sense of the world can become unwell or poisoned for lack of variety, for lack of perspective. Sometimes pornography can be poisonous in as much as people can become so consumed by the dopamine reaction that they're spending 10 or 20 hours a week hypnotized by kind of pornographic content, which is a kind of tender trap. You know, in one sense, it seems like it's really pleasant, but there are these um, complicated effects in the social sphere as well as in the imaginal sphere when it goes too far. So we put ourselves in the way of these things, and then we keep clicking that button, or, or another way of saying just taking cup after cup and throwing it down the hatch. So we become addicted and acclimated to the poison that we ingest. And, you know, there's a story about this um, that's, I think, not all that well known by Nathaniel Hawthorne, who wrote some really great uh, <laughs> short stories. And this one is called Rappuccini's Garden. And uh, in, in the story, a young man is visiting, I think, in Italy, uh, and he looks down from his room onto a courtyard where there is a beautiful woman who tends the garden in the courtyard every day. And he starts talking to her, and he falls in love with her. In the center of the garden, there's a particularly large and uh, sort of flourishing plant. And he, he proposes. He wants to come down. He wants to meet her. And she says, no, you can't because I uh, am the daughter of a, of a wizard, an evil wizard. And in the middle of the garden, this plant that I tend is toxic. And I have become inured to its fumes. And now I cannot live without this plant and its fumes. But were you to come down and even give me so much as a kiss, you would die. It's a very sobering tale about uh, poison can work its way in in a way that can't be remediated. What I like about Rappuccini's daughter, among many things, is it gives us a picture of the bivalent capacity of poison. For instance, the alchemist's daughter 
he wants to protect her when he's gone. He senses he's towards the end of his life. And so he creates this bizarre environment where the daughter will become so acclimated to certain plant poisons that she herself now exudes them so that her mere exhalation can kill a spider in a web. And that gives him a sense that his daughter is only safe when her lethality is at the forefront. A young man who becomes fascinated with her and spends more and more and more time, finally at a climax in the story, gets a glimpse of himself and just sees how incredibly sick he looks and he hadn't realized it, which was this slow process in his own body of acclimating to these poisons mm -hmm. out of a desire to have some kind of relationship with her or a non-lethal relationship with her. But that's an, a really fascinating story because there are ways that we can inherit certain kinds of archetypal defenses and complexes from our parents and even our grandparents, which at one time may have been in service to this healthy drive to survive, perhaps and survive under terrible circumstances. And our psyches are still poisoned with certain behaviors, which now don't really help us survive, but really isolate us. And as in the story, can actually make us toxic to other people who are healthier than we are. And that is an incredible, sobering statement about how trauma both infects us, but can infect others as well. I think that's really beautifully said, Joseph. And I'm, there really is something about recognizing that unconscious uh, poison transmission, as it were, and protecting yourself from it. I mean, you know, the other etymology of the word poison also comes from potion, which still goes back to that Latin potare. But, you know, poison is then associated with magic and spells. And, and being in certain kind of, let's say, um, social or familial constellations can very much feel like we've been poisoned or put under a spell. Mm -hmm. And I think the antidote to that can be a kind of consciousness about what's happening. And again, going, going back to this story about this colleague, sort of, sort of an awareness of uh, not letting it in, not taking it on. I think that's in a way uh, the essence of poison is that it is hard to identify. Now, Snow Fight is seduced by these gifts from her uh, evil mother. And uh, the young man is seduced by the woman in the garden. We don't see it coming. We, we can't identify it the way we can identify, you know, somebody's coming toward us with a club in hand, for example. It just goes in often under our awareness. And I think that's part of the story of poison. It's hidden. It's yes. not obvious. It's invisible. It's, it's a cloud of gas that rises up out of a volcano and descends into a valley and wipes out herds of animals, which actually has happened in the modern era, very frighteningly so. It's a little scratch that we get, but that thorn or that fang for that matter had a tiny bit of a chemical on it, which is having this catastrophic reaction in, in the body and particularly how the body sustains itself. A lot of poisons interrupt enzyme processes in the body, which actually prevent the machinery of the cells from completing their tasks. And then there's this kind of catastrophic system failure. But all of this speaks to the way in which the poison comes in uh, through some invisible door. And we are surprised to discover that it's gotten past the defenses of the skin, the defenses of our vigilance, 
the defenses even of our goodwill for that matter. And lo and behold, now there's something inside of me and, and I'm fighting to maintain myself, whether it's bodily integrity or psychological integrity. I'm thinking about the cases that have been written up in the literature of uh, medical people poisoning those under their care and how long it takes to detect some of these uh, serial killers. I came across uh, just one example that stands out is this Dr. Harold Shipman, who died in 2004, who was the most prolific serial killer in modern history with well over 200 proven uh, murders and probably more. Uh, maybe as many as 250. And it really illustrates exactly what you were talking about, Joseph, is that um, it gets past our awareness. It, it's, it sneaks in. It, it's, it's clandestine. It is the stuff of uh, not the, the strong, the heroic, and, and the sort of outwardly aggressive but it is the tool and the method used by the the weak, the the tricky. When you think of animals that are poisonous, I was looking up, you know, sort of the world's most venomous animals, and they are things like the box jellyfish or the poison dart frog. There are spiders and ants that are very poisonous. There's a cone snail or the small blue ringed octopus. Some mushrooms are very poisonous. So these, these tend to be generally small creatures. It's the defense or the, uh, the offense of the small and the weak in a way. So poison can be used to protect. And once one becomes known as the poisonous one, it creates a kind of wide berth around you ostensibly from one's enemies. And then the poison can be an agent of pre-digestion, by the way. So those serpents bite into the mice, the venom comes in, and the venom is beginning to break down the cellular integrity of the animal so that by the time the serpent swallows it, the digestion process has already begun. You know, I'm thinking about how uh, poison is the weapon uh, that is clandestine, that is often used by uh, smaller animals, unlike large mammals, for example. And what we haven't talked about yet is the intentional poisoning of gaslighting. And I hadn't thought about the gas lighter as someone who lacks other resources to accomplish what he or she wishes, but instead uh, attacks. Uh, his or her intended victim's uh, sense of reality and, and perception. Uh, the term comes from a 1940s film with um, Ingrid Bergman in it, in which her would-be uh, suitor or husband intentionally drives her crazy and makes her disbelieve her own experiences uh, in, in order to have access to her fortune. And that's a, a, such a great connection in a way, because what is more poisonous than self-doubt? And how crazy making it is for people to not be able to trust their sense of reality. You know, in the ancient world, poisoner, having the title of being a poisoner was often associated with being a gossip or being somebody who libeled mm, another mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they were often uh, accused of poisoning the public mind. And in ancient societies, lying, gossiping, and slander was so destructive in so many different ways that that person faced tremendous retribution to the point of being stoned to death or at the very least often being ejected from the community and shunned. I think in the ancient world, People depended on having somewhat factual data being passed around for lack of having any 
way to corroborate it. So if somebody is gaslighting or willfully poisoning the communal well of important data and information, they were considered very, very dangerous and needed to be dealt with handily. Well, well, and now, now we have such a problem as the nature of our media changes in managing, you know, sort of bad actors or, or even, even people who aren't necessarily uh, don't have nefarious motivations, but uh, just have uh, different beliefs who, who want to sort of, as you said, Joseph, kind of poison the well of public information. And, you know, who is the arbiter of whether the well is safe to drink from? I think that is a big question in public life right now. And I don't know that there's an easy answer. I also want to pivot to something that is so central to our analytic work. And I think, um, at least it may have been you who brought up the spirit Mercurius a little bit earlier. I'm not sure that was, that was, I was talking to myself, obviously. <laughs> <about that. laughs> so I was speaking to myself earlier in the podcast, talking about the uh, spirit Mercurius. And uh, Mercurius was referred to as poison and medicine mm -hmm. and was the agent of the salve et coagula. So the spirit Mercurius was in, in actual chemical work or alchemical experimentation was the great dissolving agent. Because you could, for instance, take crushed ore that might have tiny flakes of gold somehow embedded in it. You could add a bunch of mercury to it, heat it up, and the mercury would have a corrosive effect liberating the gold from the ore. And then when the mercury was boiled off, there would be this thin layer of gold that had accumulated on the inside of the vessel, which, um, without any kind of chemical explanations, looked like the mercury had created gold, but it was recognized as the great dissolving agent relative to early chemistry. So in analytic work, even though we are interested in a perspective and synth synthetic direction, a teleological direction, it's not uncommon to have to focus on things from the past that create blocks that are stuck. And this could be experiences we're stuck in, but often they're attitudes, poisonous attitudes that have become structural. And one of the difficult challenges is to find interpretive comments to introduce into the psyche of the analysand that will deconstruct the unwell stuck place inside of the psyche, which is often uncomfortable and can be misinterpreted as a kind of poison in as much as it doesn't feel good to hear some things. There are lots of truths that our analysts or our best friends will offer to us, which are very painful and might even temporarily disrupt our self-esteem. But ultimately, if the medicine is true, it allows the old attitudes to dissolve and something that is more comprehensive, more adaptive, more helpful, ultimately, to recoagulate in that open space. So often, serpent venom and a well-timed, profound interpretation are thought of as kind of metaphoric equivalents. Yeah, that's really great. And it goes to this point about dreams of being bitten by a snake can be an image of beginning a kind of necessary dissolution in a sort of initiatory process. I'm also thinking about objectivity and reason as being initially perceived often as a kind of poison, a, a little jab with a, a dart that stings of, no, it's not like this, it's like that. It wasn't so-and-so who said that, it was somebody else. It's not actually true that um, red and blue make purple. 
uh, they make something else. And the, the, there's a kind of poison when we're jolted that way that we're taken aback. It can happen certainly in the consulting room, and I think we try to be uh, gentle about it. But there is something about objective truth and reason that we can perceive as a pretty painful dose of poison. And that is the antidote for these times. These times particularly where what is true and what's not true in all kinds of realms is becoming increasingly difficult to discern. And also this coddling of the American psyche, not just American, by the way, where we are indulging ourselves to believe that we should never be challenged or everything should be affirmed or that discomfort somehow has come to equal harm. It's a terrible disservice to raise a child that way when they cannot discern the difference between being uncomfortable and being harmed and whether or not the family system itself is blurring that in the way that they use that language but particularly in the way that parents interpret the child's behavior for them which by the way is part of being a parent but we can frame things that interrupt the growth of resilience and grit for that matter so it's the wise parent who is evaluating the stressors that a kid is put under, trying to create that balance of you know the ideal creative amount of stress that a child needs to succeed and grow. And when there's too little stress, too much protection, too much insulation, and then the child's psyche can atrophy, in a way of speaking, and not grow or strengthen in ways that are necessary later in life. I want to continue that conversation by talking about this archetypal truth about poison. And as we know, all archetypes are bivalent. And uh, in Norse mythology, poison plays a very important role right at the beginning of creation. In the beginning, there's kind of Ganunga Gap, which is this limitless void. But there's also the the fire of and and heat of Muspelheim, and then there's the ice of Niflheim, and the ice of Niflheim contains in it uh, this um, ha- has been fed by the Alivagar rivers, which have poison in them. Apparently, I think initially from some serpents. And when these two, when the ice and the fire meet, they result in this substance that's called eider. And eider gives birth to, or, or, or gives uh, life to uh, kind of the first being, this giant emir. And there's a sense from this really remarkable creation myth that not only is poison life-giving, but it's also just woven into all of creation. And, you know, it's not unambivalent at all. It, it will eventually pollute the world at, at the end of the world, at, at Ragnarok. There's something very big about this idea. Poison seems to simply be an inherent part of human reality. It's right there in the creation myths of at least least two societies that we know of. And that there is something mysterious and magical about it. And I think we can end our discussion today uh, just with a small celebration of the mysterious and uh, somewhat alluring weird ingredients that are often reputed to go into making poisons, such as dragon's tongue, ogre's teeth, ectoplasm, bone marrow, frost salts, and from our friend William Shakespeare, eye of newt, toe of frog, wool of bat, and tongue of dog. 
And so, as he says, bubble, bubble, toil and trouble. And perhaps with that, we'll switch to a dream. Did you know your dreams reveal the wisdom of your guiding self? Dreams connect us to the secret world within and remind us that we're never alone. We're always accompanied by our inner companion who offers healing, balance, insight, and guidance as we make key decisions. At 28, Charles felt lost and isolated. He had a dream that touched him deeply. As he worked with the dream in dream school, he understood that it was showing him how he was profoundly connected to life. This powerful insight led him to make real progress with his goals. During Dream School's 12-month transformational program, you'll learn to harness the power of your unconscious wisdom, decode the language of metaphor and symbol, discover mythological motives that shape your life, reveal unknown facets of your personality, unlock the door to inner wisdom. To enroll, just go to interpretmydream.net and sign up today to gain immediate access to the first three Dream School modules. Your best life awaits you at Dream School, and we can't wait to see you there. Our dreamer today is a male who is 40. He was a teacher and a user experience designer, and he's about to start a job as a baker. And here's his dream. I am, quote, cooking up a batch of xenomorphs from the movie Alien for a, quote, client in an underground lab. I'm mixing chemicals in a vat and realized I missed a step. I call the client and am reassured it will still work. It will just take some extra time. The chemicals coagulate into a pink goo. The next day, I return to the lab and see swimming in a pool of water four adolescent xenomorphs. A male lab assistant tells me this shouldn't have worked. They mutated and can only breathe flesh. I see the adolescent aliens all have a call of pink ectoplasm over their faces. The next day, I return to the lab and there is only one xenomorph, an adult, chained as if crucified to the back wall of a cell, wreathed in shadow. I peer at it from across the cell, and a white dove appears and flies across it. The alien's claw shoots out and snatches the dove from the air and crams it into its mouth. There is a great sucking sound, and I realize the alien is breathing the dove's flesh. My vision zooms into the alien's face. It regurgitates the dove's carcass, which inverts into a black cage of bone, and the alien screams. I am shocked awake. For context, he adds, I'm contemplating a job offer to be the head baker at an upscale restaurant after working for years as a freelancer. At the same time, I feel myself powerfully drawn to Jungian psychology, and I'm seriously considering a career in therapy. The main feelings in the dream were, I felt curious and excited by the possibilities of what I was making. Only in the final moment did I feel fear. And he adds, after brushing up against psychology in graduate school studying symbolic systems, I have felt alienated by my attempts to find a therapy that works for me. But after reading Memories, Dreams, and Reflections and hearing this podcast, I've been immersing myself in Jungian thought. Well, I would say to this dreamer, if baking or psychology don't work out for you, you should seriously consider a career in uh, film writing. (laughs) It is such a kind of cinemagraphic dream, isn't it? Yes. I'm aware that I'm working just to follow the complicated storyline, so to speak, um, of this dream. Well, well, here, here's, I'm just going to sort of start from the top and, and just kind of narrate what I'm, what I'm saying. First of all, um, he's in an underground lab. Yes. So we're, we're in the, the unconscious here and he's cooking something up. So he's, he's, he's making something and what he's making is a xenomorph, 
which um, I did look that up, and that is what the aliens in the movie Alien are called. But xenomorph comes from the Greek for foreign form. So this is an image of the other in the unconscious that is being kind of um, constellated, I want to say, by some ego efforts. So it, it might potentially be a, a version of shadow. And it's interesting because uh, it, it, at first there are four of them. Four is this important number, this number of wholeness. So there's kind of some kind of um, inchoate sense of something taking shape. I find it interesting that, that he's missed a step. By the way, he's mixing chemicals. So there's also some, something mm -hmm. kind of alchemical going on here. And, and he's missed a step, but it looks like it's going to be okay. I, I wonder about that in terms of sort of psychological development. You know, so sometimes we get excited, say, by the archetypal possibilities inherent in Jungian work, and we want to kind of rush forward, and, and we, don't, we don't get that we've, we've missed a step of development, and we have to kind of go back and lay the groundwork and do the basics. But, but this is, this is going to work, e even though it, it might, might have been a bit rushed. You know what I am curious about from the very beginning? Um, he's, quote, cooking something up, which uh, kind of has overtones or undertones of sort of like a, a home science experiment. Uh, and he's doing it for a client that is never named or identified in the underground lab uh, in this place of shadow. So I'm just wanting to pay attention to a kind of feeling tone of experimentation rather than a feeling tone, let's say, of dedication to, uh, to a serious purpose, including that he missed a step. Deb, I, I think you're on to something there. And it, it calls up for me the, the story of the Sorcerer's Apprentice, which is an, an ancient story, and there's many different versions of it. But it's the sense that uh, the, the, the sorcerer knows what he's doing. He's working with some really dangerous things. The Sorcerer's Apprentice, uh, you know, it's that old thing about um, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. And the sorcerer's apprentice goes off and, uh, in one version of the story, commands some of the same powers that the sorcerer himself has, but they get out of control and they wind up being really dangerous. So I, I wonder if we're in that territory somehow here. Yeah. The, the attitude of the dream ego seems quite casual and, and very much like the sorcerer's apprentice, you know, tinkering around in the lab. Yeah, I think that the the ego has a certain kind of um, Frankenstein-like medical curiosity. And just like Frankenstein, there can be these unintended consequences, which can be tricky. In one sense, the creation of the xenomorph, it's a little bit like the creation of the golem, which is the old Jewish folklore. The golem was created to protect the Jews and to carry their repressed aggression to carry the part of them that really wanted to fight but was restrained by certain religious prohibitions but some symbolic creature needed to carry this ability to fight and go to war and protect it also reminds us of course of frankenstein and the idea of the ego's hubris um, dr frankenstein can command the powers of life and death and the reanimation of flesh but what I am drawn to is a, an obscure reference that Jung makes to the alchemical monstrosity. And when Jung is talking about alchemy, which ultimately has to do with the sublimation of various parts of the personality in service to a new image of the ego that is granted by the relationship with the self. That's the great alchemical work. Sometimes 
as the personality moves into a kind of salve or a dissolving period, it can be reorganized in a kind of funny way where instead of the self assuming the organizational uh, predominance, that something in the shadow, something in the unintegrated instinctive world grabs hold of the alchemical mixture and turns it into something less beautiful than the ego self access, which is something that we're seeing here, that out of the gluten, so to speak, which they sometimes call the gluten of the eagle, this kind of demonic creature comes forth. And instead of being awestruck by the image of the dove, which is often a symbol of the Holy Spirit, that it gobbles up that spiritual attitude and pulls it into this primal, instinctive, predatory dynamism. Now, not to despair, the idea of the primal instincts rising up and swallowing something is also part of alchemy, but it's part of the earlier part of alchemy, where the green lion rises up and swallows the sun, which happens when the repressed instincts become apparent in the alchemical work, and they gobble up the ego, which is the capacity to regulate everything, and all of a sudden we find ourselves subject to very intense feelings, desires, fantasies, hopes, wishes, etc., that we have disavowed for one reason or another over the course of our lives. So the gobbling up of the sun and the gobbling up of the dove is related to the correction of the alchemical monstrosity. So we're going to go back to the drawing board and we're going to return to instinct, pure apex predator instinct. And that's going to be the thing that has to be dealt with because the higher mercurial formulations have failed to constellate the ego self axis. That's, that's really brilliant. And, and the, the notion that uh, this is going to, there needs to be a corrective here for this sort of apex predator kind of monstrosity is that it is chained as if crucified. So it needs to be sacrificed somehow. I, I think that I'm also struck, and I, I think this just supports everything we're all saying, by the feelings in the dream. He felt curious and excited which again is that there's a kind of naivete about that. Like you yes. are, you were dealing in some deadly serious territory here. I don't know that curiosity and excitement are exactly right. And then he feels fear. And I think it's good he feels fear. I think fear is probably appropriate. So he has been shocked awake, not only from the dream itself, but shocked into a need for greater consciousness about what is going on, what the stream means for him and his life and life choices. And I think there is a recommendation implied. If we take the dream as, let's say, the diary entry of an alchemist, it starts with, I'm cooking up a batch of xenomorphs, which if we were to translate into alchemical languages, I'm setting about to create a homunculus, like <laughs> a little creature. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm putting a bunch of stuff in the vat, et cetera, et cetera. What comes out is this, you know, howling instinctive monster. In the alchemical medieval documents, that the alchemist would spend days to months preparing for the alchemical operation. And most of the preparation was religious. You would fast, you would pray, you'd sleep these hours, you'd eat certain foods, you'd have to bathe when the moon is in a certain position. And all of that, we could say, is to cultivate a very rarefied religious feeling 
about this miraculous creation that one is attempting, that one has to be close to God in order to act like God in this symbolic system and to act like God in a way where one can create life. So I think what's missing here is, quite frankly, the humility of the religious attitude in order for the new life to have the sanction of the self. And what we're seeing here is is how things work differently in the absence of the religious attitude. And just to clarify, by religious attitude, I don't mean that we all have to be a member of a conventional religion, but we do have to have a sense that something is greater than my ego, is greater than my waking personality. And quite frankly, one of the ways that that can show up with difficulty is the refusal to submit to an analysis that he feels alienated by his attempts to find a therapy that works for him. I'm going out on a limb, don't know this person, but one way that we could think about it instructively is that my ego really refuses to be in a position that feels inferior to an analyst who I might temporarily think is superior or to a divinity or an image of God that could be superior to me. And without that relativization of the ego, the efforts to change oneself can have unintended consequences. Or or monstrous consequences. Because, Joseph, you're, you know, just sort of beautifully going back to your point about the lack of uh, an appropriate ego self access that hasn't that because the ego self access depends on that sense of being in right relationship with something larger so the through line i think to everything we've we've said in response to the stream would be something like hubris and again just to be humble about it we look at dreams purely from an educative standpoint We don't know this fellow. We don't mean to impugn or make assumptions about his character, but hopefully we can all look at this dream as uh, a learning opportunity or as an object lesson. And this particular frame of looking at shadow and ego self and alchemy and to see how we can make sense of that. You've been listening to This Jungian Life, From our website, thisunionlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this union life.